Okay, so what I'd like to do today is uh, sort of finish our safari, uh, and then I'd like to talk, sort of transition from the safari into, uh, basically the safari is looking at all these different soil orders, but I'd like to go a little bit deeper into soil taxonomy so we have an idea about what these characteristics are that really distinguish these soils. At this order, we're at, the, at this level, we're basically looking at the orders. We're looking at really dramatic features that distinguish one soil order from another soil order. But you can certainly imagine as we start drilling into these soils or getting more and more refined, getting down to the species level in essence, that we're looking at characteristics across all the soils that could be affecting all the different orders. And so in uh, a molar soil, for example, you could have a molar soil that's being distinguished because of high surface accumulation of organic matter, but you could have high accumulations of organic matter in other orders, but in that case, probably a lesser amount. Okay, so later on in this lecture, we're basically going to start talking about how we continue this sort of distinguishing or this, this, this diagnostic pathway to basically look at soil taxonomy. But let's finish the soil tour. Let's put this into slide mode. No, I don't like that. Come on. All right, so our next soil order. Uh, is molar soils. Okay? These are soils across the landscape, but where the, the diagnostic feature or the distinguishing factor is really high surface accumulation of organic matter. Okay? These are not histosoils, though. These are still mineral soils. The surface horizons are dark. They're high in bases, high in nutrients, well structured. If they have high organic matter, you would imagine they have good structure. And they're dom the dominant vegetation in these is prairie grasses or grasslands. These are grasslands. All right, let's see if this works. Oh, look at that. Okay, here's a map of the United States. Classic Great Plains. If we go back to the rest of the world, we're looking at the steppes, you know, moving all the way from China all the way into Eastern Europe. Okay, the United States. Oh, actually, down here, the Pampas, down in here. Okay, whoops, wrong way. United States, nice big swath right down the Great Plains. This is what we would call the tall grass the short, and the mid grass, the short grass prairies. We're moving into that zone. Okay. Um, the diagnostic question that soil taxonomy asks is the one up at the top. These are soils with argillic or candic horizons, or a fragipan, and a base saturation. Oops, that's not right. I'm looking at all the soils here. Oh. That's the wrong question. I apologize. The question is really, we're looking for molic epipedons. Sorry, that just totally screwed my. All right, so we're looking for molic epipedons. Um, if we look at these soils across the United States, we're basically looking at a moisture transect. You saw this before I showed you the slide earlier when we were talking about climate. Molar soils are a really good example of climate change, OK? As the climate changes from the wet east to the dry west, you move through alpha soils here where, the, where I still have timber into the molar soils where I have eudic molar soils, which are moist molar soils, versus eustic, which are drier. And we'll talk about what those terms mean in a few minutes. But we're looking at a transect from mixed grasses that are tall into short grasses. And ultimately, as these systems get drier and drier and drier into Aridosols, desert soils. Okay, looking at it from this perspective, these U stalls are the drier ones, these U dolls are the wetter ones. So the green is these wetter ones moving into the drier ones here, but we're basically looking at the prairie. Okay, what's this landscape look like? Right now, it's basically all agriculture. This is the invention of the steel moorboard plow, basically opened up the prairie for cutting. Okay, and we're looking at field crops. Flat, gently rolling topography, grassland. Farther out west, these grasslands go right up into the Rockies. We're still looking at these grasslands. Most of it is actually, not most of it, much of it is under some sort of field crop. Here's an example, corn. This is classic, classic grasslands. Okay, now if we think about these grasslands and we're thinking about these 
high surface accumulations of organic matter, where is that organic matter coming from? The grasses. Okay. Around here, when we have leaf fall, all the organic matter is basically dropped right at the surface. Okay. But with grasses, yes, the top grass, the top part of the grasses are dying, but the roots themselves are also shutting off or shunting off pieces of the root every year. And so as a result, these horizons get re oops, wrong way again. These horizons get really deep. Okay. A foot and a half down. And that's actually fairly shallow. Keep going the wrong way. Why are you? Chris, this is not working. <laughs> um, so here's some slides of them. Okay, here is a deep one. You've got some T's in here. This is not, what is going on here? I'm not liking this. These are not molosoils. Oh, well, actually, maybe they are. Yeah, you know, they are maybe molecules. Well, this is definitely, well, this is close. Oh, okay. Slides are not working today. This is probably my fault for changing slides up. Let's move to alpha soils. Hopefully, <laughs> I'll come back to molecules. So I'll try to update that one. Okay, alpha soils. We're moving through the questions here. Alpha soils, accumulation of translocated clays. I'll give this a shot again, actually. Um, accumulation of translocated translocated clays into the subsoil, very similar to those ultisoils, but in this case we're looking at at least 35 percent bases. The ultisoils had less than 35 percent. The alpha soils have more than 35 percent. Okay, alpha soils, more fertility. Okay, there is little organic accumulation at the surface compared to histosol and molosol, but there is some. Okay, this is the percentage in the United States, a good chunk of in New York, but this eastern section of the Midwest and the central Midwest moving into the mole soils that are over here. So we're looking at still forested, you get down to the sort of the Mississippi and that's sort of the boundary between forested on this side and grasslands on that side. Has to do with the fire regime, but look at where these soils are. Between the mole soils and the alpha soils, and I'll talk about this later, but this is one of the reasons why the United States is such an agricultural power. We are blessed with really, really good soils. Okay, so the question here, and this is actually the correct question, soils with an argillic, candic, or nature horizon, that's a zone of accumulation of clays, okay? It may or may not have a fragile pan with clay skins, but that's the diagnostic, that is the criteria that distinguishes these soils from all others. Now, you heard me say here that these soils have to have a 35% base saturation. Okay? This question is basically the same question that we ask with ultisols. But with ultisols, we asked one more thing. We asked, does the soil have less than 35% base saturation? Okay? This may sound like it's a little nitty gritty or a little picky, but because I have already asked, if the soil has less than 35% base saturation, all the soils that are left at this point that have an argillic, candic, or natric have to have more than 35% base saturation. And because I've already asked this question with ulta soils, I don't have to ask that this soil has more than 35% base saturation. Does that make sense? Kind of? Okay. So let's keep going. The distribution, oh, wrong way. This is what these landscapes look like. This could be central New York. This could be the Midwest. This could be actually a little bit out west, or this could be the edges of the Adirondacks. These are what these soils look like. Okay, we have accumulations down here. Here are some E horizons, a BT through here. Organic enrichment at the top, but not as thick as those mole soils, and certainly not as thick as those histosols. A little bit more development with BWE. Here's a fragipan. A series of fragipans, you guys have met them at this point. E's, BT's with a mixing of B and C material down here. Deeper soils with a series of BT's. Okay. All of these soils have, one, have two things in common. One thing is the diagnostic. All of them have an accumulation of clay, a natric, a candic, or an argillic. 
Because I've already asked about ultisols, I don't have to ask the question anymore, does it have more than 35% bases? But it does. The next soil is an inceptosoil. Okay, inception, these are the soils that have the initial stages of weathering and soil development. Okay, they have, have horizons of alteration. You'll notice that they are everywhere across the planet. Okay, anywhere that there's been any kind of disturbance and that soil has been able to sit there for a little period of time, just enough to start developing horizons, we're going to find these inceptosoils. The United States, we have a huge chunk of inceptosoils right here, southern tier of New York's, northern tier of Pennsylvania. But basically, this line right here, that's the glaciation line. So all of these inceptosoils are basically sitting on top of the, above the glaciation line, which totally makes sense if you think about it. This zone right here was disturbed within the last 23,000 years. So as a result, the soil's parent material in here is really young. So the soils have only had, at most, 23,000 years to develop. Below that line, you still have some, but a much smaller percentage. The darker the color, the more percentage of land is in inceptosoil. Right? White, less than 1% inceptosoil. Dark brown, more than 76. Huge swaths. Basically, where all of glaciation occurred in the montanes or the sheet, the ice sheet. Does that make sense? Does that distribution make sense? Okay, what do these soils look like? Questions? So, what's the distinguishing factor? The distinguishing factor of these guys, the question is soils with a cambic, there's a whole list of different types of horizons, but soils with some alteration from the parent material. The simple way of saying it, horizons, it has a horizon of alteration. Some structure or color development. But not strong enough to have become a very distinguishing feature like a spodic horizon or an argillic horizon. It has insufficient alluviation, alluviation to have produced clay accumulations anywhere. So Right there, it says to you, these are fairly young materials. But they have been weathered, just not very much. That's the distribution. And this is what that landscape looks like all over the place. These soils, you can start seeing some distinguishing factors in here, maybe some BWs. Okay, All different kinds of landscapes, basically all the way from bedrock to basically see material calling all the way up to the top. But the only really distinguishing horizon that you're seeing in these are these BWs. I think I have another set of, no I don't. The only real distinguishing feature here is those BWs, those cambic horizons, initial stages of weathering and horizon production. Okay, you know, I'm, at this point you probably figured out that we're basically going from the most developed or the most distinguished to the less developed or the least distinguished. And that ends us up at the entosols. Okay? Entosols do not have any shrink swell behavior. They don't have those types of clays. Those clays haven't developed. They're not well developed. They're very young. And they're found, when we say young, we mean not developed. The soil might have been sitting there for quite, the soil material might have been sitting there for quite some time. But genetic, genetic processes, soil genesis processes, have not really occurred because of whatever reason. Okay? They're found in all kinds of climates and all different kinds of vegetation, okay? distributed across the entire planet uh, and across the United States. This is that dark feature, the same thing, lighter the color, the less of it there is. This nice little dark one here we have down here. But I want you to focus on this section right here. Does anybody know what that area is? Leopold. Clue. Author. Author. Aldo. What? Leopold. Not Pikes Peak. <laughs> These are the sand hills. The sand hills of Nebraska. Okay. Dune country, sand dune country. Okay, if these dunes are being moved, now they're basically been stabilized by vegetation, but if they're being moved, that material never really gets a chance to develop horizonation. 
Okay? So if we take a look at some of this kind of landscape, it could be riparian stuff where I'm getting lots and lots of floods year after year after year. So I'm having lots of accumulation but never having a chance to really develop soils. Um, let's take a look at this slide. You know, sort of deserts, but look in the background. If that stuff is blowing and that sand dune is moving every year, any kind of horizons that are developing in that are basically going to be destroyed as the material moves. Okay, here, every time this starts flooding, I might start seeing some sort of genesis here, but it keeps getting buried. Okay, does that make sense? These are entosols recent being the, uh, you know, the, uh, the word that we're looking at, okay, the key word. This is what some of these profiles potentially look like. We're looking at an A sitting on top of rock material. We're looking at raw parent material with an AP on top of it. Somebody decided to plow the sand dune or whatever, put in some agriculture. Oops. I thought I had more slides, more pictures of these. But <coughs> Does this give you an idea about what these kinds of landscapes look like? Okay. Now, the key thing here is these are those distinguishing factors. We have 12 of these orders. These distinguishing factors basically just discreetly partition. These are the characteristics that say this is this type of soil, this is this type of soil. Okay. Now, here are the 12, and I throw this up here just to give you guys an idea about the area distribution of these soils across the planet. This first one. It's the percentage global that this soil order is. Okay, so alpha soils, there's 9.6% of the ice-free land is alpha soils. Okay, the second line here is the United States. Okay, now I want you to look at these numbers, but I also want you to look at this one. This is natural fertility. Okay, high to low. Now, one of the reasons that the United States, and I said this earlier, but one of the reasons the United States is so good of an agricultural powerhouse is because we are blessed with very good soils. Now take a look at this one right here and this one right here. First one's alpha soils, the second one is mole soils. Globally, there are 9.6% of the 9.6% of the ice-free land is alpha soils. In the United States, 14.5. Mole soils, globally, 7% of the land is molosols. 22.4% of the United States is molosols. And look at the fertility. This is why the United States is the breadbasket for the world. Because we have very fertile soils and we have a lot of them. That's not to say that we, have not, we don't have other ones, but we have, we've been, we have this great advantage. Okay, so. We've been talking about soil taxonomy. You saw this slide before, or something similar to it. This is basically plant classification, and this is basically soil classification. With plants, we go through phylums, class, subclass, order, family, until we get down to genus and species. This is what most of us are familiar with. If we're talking about white clover, trifolium repens. Okay, that's trifolium is the genus, repens is the species. Okay, we do the same thing with soil taxonomy. You guys have now met the orders. Alpha soil, high base saturation, clay accumulation. That's the distinguishing factor. Okay? We then have suborders. We have great groups, subgroups, family, down to series and phase. Series and phase basically match genus and species. You guys have met the orders, and you guys have met the series level. This is when I start calling things an arc port soil or a marden soil. That's the series level. What I'd like to do for the next maybe 15 minutes is I'd like to explain how we move from order to series. And I want to explain some of the distinguishing features that we're looking at. Okay, so when we start at the order level, we are looking for what we believe is the most important distinguishing feature to discriminate between one type of soil and another. As we move down through the classification, we're still looking at discrete discriminations, but they are not as important as the one above it. So suborder is important. The discrete, the, the discrete units that we're looking at is important, but it's not as important from a genetic sense as the order. Great group is important, but not as important as suborder. 
and so on down the line until we get down to the series level. Does that make sense to everybody? So let's look at these discriminating, discriminating characteristics that we believe are the things that are driving soil genesis. That are things that are creating these soils. Okay, this slide you've seen before, these are the formative elements, these are the orders. Okay, here's the order, that's a triangle that you've seen before. Here are the orders, and here are the suborders that fit under the order. In most cases, the suborder is being driven by some sort of climatic condition. Now remember what the distinguishing characteristics were for the orders. Primarily they were parent material or, and or they were some sort of climatic thing. Okay, if it's an andosoil, it's volcanic material, right? If it's a histosoil, it's organic material. If it's an aridosoil, it's a climatic condition, right? Big order issues, okay? We start moving down, wrong way, we start moving down. Okay, here's those alpha soils, translocated clays, high bases. The suborders, the next distinguishing thing that we're looking at, this is an aquic, cryic, eudic, eustic, xeric, you don't know what those terms mean at this point, but those are all climatic conditions. Entosoil, aquic, arenic, fluvic, orthic, samic, salmon. This last one is sandy, okay? In fact, those sand hills that I showed you in Nebraska, those are all salmons, sandy entosoils, okay? Water, water, water horizons, inceptosoils. All of these, generally in the suborder level, are all about climate, unless the distinguishing factor for the order level was in fact climate. Good example there is aridosols. Here's aridosols. The suborders actually have, it's our argids, calcids, cambids, cryids, there's actually a climate one, durids, gypsics, and salads. These are all salads. <laughs> we'll explain what that means in a second. But these are all features that have to do with horizonation of some form or another, with the exception of the cryid. The cryid is basically cryic aridosol. Cryic means cold. Okay? The terminology is right here. These are the formative elements for the suborders. Okay? There's a boatload of them. I don't expect you guys to remember them. And I don't expect you guys to memorize them because we have them on charts. We have tables of them here. But sal for salad, let's use that one. Sal, Latin for salt. So if I have a salad, a sal aridosol, what kind of aridosol do you think I have? <coughs> a salty one. Does that make sense? Okay, let's take another one here. Cry, Greek, cryos, means ice cold. If I have a cryid, a cry aridosol, what kind of aridosol do I have? A cold one. Does that make sense? Okay, let's keep going. Okay, once we've got the molosols and we have their, the, the examples I hear, we have here is molosols, alpha-sols, ultasols, okay? These are the aquals, so molosols that are aquic, aquic water, wet molosols. That is the suborder. The next sequence down from order to suborder, the next one down is great group. So the next level of importance for the distinguishing factors. I've got an aqual that has an argillic horizon. I would call it an argy aqual, an argillic aquic molosoil. Does that make sense? Okay, so I have a molosoil that's wet and it has argillic horizons, BT horizons, right? If I have a udol, udic is a moist molosoil. I have an argillic horizon in a moist molosoil. Does that make sense to everybody? And as I go down through the order to suborder, to great group, subgroup, I'm looking at lesser and lesser and lesser important distinguishing factors. The higher the level, the more important the distinguishing factor. Does that make sense? We can keep going with this. 
Ultimately, we get to the great groups. This is the great group list. These are all those formative elements. Okay, we had aquic, water saturated. Okay, we also had argillic, argri. Oops, that's not it. Where's the argillic? Rg, argillic horizon. Does that make sense? So by looking at these formative elements, you can figure out what it is that distinguishes this soil. How did this soil come to be? Well, it was a mole soil, so it's a grassland soil. It was formed in a wet environment, and it has argillic formation. Make sense? Let's keep going. Oop, wrong way. All right. Once we get to, oh, actually, I had it down here. So here's the Martin soil. This is the Martin soil that you guys met this week. Okay. We start over here. Ept. Ept is formative element for insepta soil. If it's an insepta soil, it's showing horizonation, distinguishing horizonation. Eudic. Eudic is moist, not wet, moist. Okay. It's a wet insepta soil. It's got a fragi. What do you think that means? It's got a fragipan. And it's a typical one. Okay, this would be order, suborder, great group, subgroup. The next group that we go down to is called family. Family is a large area of distinguishing factors. Family covers particle size class, mineralogy, cation exchange activity, and the soil temperature regime. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, here is the honey oil. Okay, honey oil is a soil series. This is the state soil, New York State soil. Okay, it is a glossic hap udolf. Okay, alf, alf, alpha soil. It's eudic, moist, alpha soil. Haplo means horizonation. It's got distinguishing horizons. Glossic means basically it's tongue. It means tongues, but those horizons have a tongue-like nature, so they're wavy. Okay, and then this group right up here, this is the family. Green is the particle size. It's a fine loamy particle size. Okay, mineralogy is this sort of purplish pink thing. It's got a mixed mineralogy. It's a young soil. It's New York State. It's got a lot of mixing. Okay, cation exchange capacity. We haven't talked about that yet, but it's basically a measurement of the charge of that soil. You've got to imagine as these crystals are put together, there's going, I mean, there's electric, electrical charge. I mean, you've got ions and electrons moving all over the place, right? Okay. There's going to be a charge associated with these particles. Okay. If it has a high charge, we call it superactive. If it has a low charge, we call it subactive. Okay. In this case, it's an active, so it's got a high charge, which is not a supercharged. It's an active cation exchange capacity, and it's got a mesic temperature regime. Mesic right down here. Mean annual temperature is between 8 and 15 degrees Celsius. Okay. And there is a difference of greater than 6%, uh, 6%, 6 degrees between winter and summer. What kind of climate is that? It's the climate we live in. We have a winter, we have a summer. The mean annual temperature, when we look at all of the temperature, is basically between 8 degrees and, and 15 degrees. Okay, summertime temperatures 25 plus, wintertime temperatures 0 minus. Okay, so I have a delta of greater than 6 degrees. You average it out though, it comes out to someplace between 8 and 15. Mesic climate. Does that make sense? That's the family level. Okay. Now, if we take a soil, this happens to be a Kokomo. Okay, if we take a soil and basically classify it out, Kokomo is a mola soil. Okay. It is a wet molar soil, so it's an aqual. Okay. It has an argillic horizon in it, so it is an RG aqual. And it is the classic example, or it's a typical example, so we call it a typic RG aqual. Okay. The Kokomo also has a fine loamy texture. It has a mixed mineralogy. It has an active CEC, and it lives in a mesic temperature regime, like us. And as a result, uh, not as a result, but we call this dog Kokomo, or cat, or zebra, or whatever it happens to be. Go. How do you know when something is typical? It's uh, typic is a, you're, you're asking about, so the question was, how do you know when something's typical? Okay, typic is um, a term that we use when the 
soil that we're looking at meets all the expectations for that type of soil. Now, if there is exceptions to it, we would have another term for it. Here, actually, you know what? Let's look at the soils that we have around here, okay? You guys have met the arc ports and the Martins. Next week, you guys are probably gonna meet the Colomer, and about two weeks, you're gonna meet the Hudson. You may or may not meet the Bath, depending upon our mapping exercise that we're gonna be doing next week. But let's take a look at the arc port, okay? Alpha is the formative element of this, alpha soil. It's eudic. There's another alpha soil here. This is the columnar that you're going to meet next week. Okay, it too is eudic. Okay, eudic means wet, uh, means moist, not wet. Okay, so we have two wet alpha soils. Haplo basically means horizonation. Haplo, haplo, so that I've got nice distinguishing horizons. In this case, I have lamellic horizons. Do you guys remember the arc ports? Those BTs, thin BTs? Remember me describing them as lamella? Maybe I didn't. Some, I, some groups I did, some groups I de didn't. But those horizons are lamellic. The columnar, on the other hand, those horizons are gloss aquic, tongue driven by water, wet, tonguey horizonation. We're going to have nice BTs in these argillics, but they're not going to be thin like the, they are with the, with the arc port. Okay. Mesic climate regime, basically all of these are mesic climate regime. That's the climate regime we live in. And these are all soils from around here. Okay, Martin is an insecta soil. Eudic with a fragipan, and it's a typical example of it. Okay, so we have a number of alpha soils. We have, we have three alpha soils, two insecta soils. We have uh, all of them are in eudic moisture, okay. We have haplo here, we have haplo here, we have a fragipan in the martin and in the bath. We don't have it in the columnar, but we have the glossa aquic, but we also, versus the lamellic from the columnar and the, and the arc port. Just from the name, look at all the stuff that we found out about it. Now, let's look at the front end of it. The family end, coarse loamy, coarse loamy, coarse loamy textures in the arc port, the marn, and the bath. We get in the columnar, we start getting to fine silty. These are lake laid. And then we get into Hudson, these are lake laid too. But these tend to be silty, these tend to be clay. E, clay E. Okay, fine silty. <coughs> Mineralogy tends to be mixed until we get to the Hudson. It's a clay, and the clays are lytic clays. Active, 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 active. We don't have any notification of active here, but because we have a lytic clays, we know what the CECs are. These guys are mixed, so they can have all different kinds of mineralogy, so we don't necessarily know what the CEC is, so we tell you that it's active. And in all cases, we're looking at a mesic climate. Does that make sense to everybody? This, uh, I'm going to give you guys some practice, OK? What I would like you guys to do, do you guys remember that homework that I gave you, that take home thing where you went out and you took a look at a monolith and I wanted you to describe that monolith? Well, I want you to do for Monday, I want you to go back to that same monolith and I want you to look at its classification. Okay, if you happen to pick arc port, your classification is going to be coarse, loamy, mixed, active, mesic, lamellic, hapudolf. Take a look at the monolith at the very top. You've got the series name and you have the classification. Take a look at that classification and parse it out. Tell me what it actually means. If you have the arc port, you have an alpha sole, a eudic moisture regime, it's moist, it's got lamella in it, it's a mesic climate, it's got a coarse loamy texture, it's got a mixed mineralogy, and it's got an active CEC. Those are the features that distinguish this soil. Those are the genetic characteristics that parse this soil apart from all the others. Does that make sense to everybody? Questions? Go. So on Arcport, it will always be all of those things? Arcport, the classification for Arcport is always going to be this. Yeah, we'll have the name, and right underneath the name, literally, you don't have to look up Arcport or whatever. It will have this classification right underneath it. Did you guys notice that when you were out there? 
It was this sort of Greek Roman esque thing going on underneath. Okay, it looked like gobbledygook. Well, now you can understand the gobbledygook, and that gobbledygook tells you a lot about those soils, right? Okay, we feel comfortable with this. Yes, no, go. You can't have an arc port with no CEC. If we go back to those, we don't actually have a term that's called inactive. It doesn't matter what you are. You're going to have some sort of charge, whether it's positive or negative. Okay. But you can have soils that have really low cation exchange capacity, and we call those subactive, less than 0.24 cation exchange capacity percent for a percent clay. No, it wouldn't be an arc port. It would be something else. Arc ports, and this is honey oil, arc ports are always going to have active. If you have an arc port, you have active. Okay? If you have a Hudson, you have a lytic clays, which tell you what the activity is. Does that make sense? I mean, it would, in, in essence, if I said it was act, lytic and active, I'm saying the same thing twice. So they don't, they don't put it in. Uh, it's like saying it's cold, frosty. I guess frosty cold. I don't know, whatever. I'm trying to come up with a good example. Not quite that. What? Pale white. Does that make sense, sort of, guys? Yes? So are you ever really going to find one of these soil series like, in a completely different part of the world? Or are they all pretty? The, so the question is, are we going to find these soils in, uh, and I can go back to this. This slide. Any one of these slides. We'll take this slide. Okay. The question was, am I going to find any of these soil series in totally other parts of the world? And the answer is no, because you've got to think about how these soils are formed. These soils are formed due to similar conditions. Five soil forming factors, four processes. Okay. Here, now let's look at this one. We got, uh, let's look at the stream here. Okay. All these aquents in here, basically entosols along the stream. These are all aquents, so this is the order level. But all of the soils in here are going to be similar on the, uh, at the order level. But as we start refining in down to the series level, those series are going to get smaller and smaller in, in distribution. Because the formative element, the thing that distinguished these things, the things that made these soils what they are today, the genesis of the soil, are all going to be, I don't want to say regional in nature, but they're all going to be generally found in the same location. Now, there are some that are not. I mean, you can imagine an entosol, for example, where I'm, let's go back to entosols. This is the distribution, not this one. There's the distribution. Going the wrong way. Here's the worldwide distribution of entosols. Okay, I can certainly imagine that some of the sandy stuff that we see here in the sand hills I'm going to find here in Africa or in northern China. I, I can certainly imagine it. But when I start getting down to the really refined, down to the series level, I'm certainly there's going to be something different here than here than here. <laughs> there may not be. But it's more than likelihood as you get closer and closer, you're going to have more and more ref, 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 refinement. Go. Marns are basically stretched across sort of from New England through Pennsylvania into Ohio and then south. But there, you're only going to, let's go back to the United States, you're only going to find <coughs> Marns, you know, stretching through in here. In all the world. And you might actually find some up here as well, but basically in all the world. Now, there might actually be something very similar to Marn in Europe because you might have had the same parent materials, you might have the same climatic conditions, in fact, you might have something that is basically Martin. It's possible. But you have to look for those locations that have the same conditions that produce the Martins here someplace in the world. And it's possible. In fact, it's highly likely, actually. But does that make sense? Yeah. Does that make sense to everybody? Go. Uh, if your lytic soils are active, what would be an example of superactive soils? Um, thinking some of the salty end of the spectrum. Um, some of the super active ones. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think. Uh, actually, it wouldn't be the salty. The salty would be the, that would be the salts that are in the CEC. Um, <coughs> perhaps some of the chloritic ones, because um, they have lots of um, 
Off the top of my head, I can't think of what types of clays that you would be looking for that are specifically super active. I can come back with an answer on that one, though. Go. No, so it, it, this, we're getting into sort of calloid chemistry here. But the, the reason soil, some, soil, some clays are super active and some are not active, you have to imagine how these clays are formed. Now, let's go back to sort of how the primary minerals were formed. Primary minerals are formed from this magma as it cools and turns into crystals. Okay? So as it crystallizes, you can imagine that a lot of different elements are going to sort of fit into this lattice. I mean, it's a crystal, right? Um, so here's our crystal. Imagine, you know, sorry about the drawing. Okay, there's our crystal, right? Something that looks something like that. Okay, well that crystal is made up of millions or billions and billions of little elements that, are, 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 that have been attached to each other. Okay, there's basically two types of lattice structures that you're looking at. There's a silica-based one and there's an, alum, an alumin-based one. Okay, and they have oxygen. So this is a silica oxide and this is an aluminum oxide. Okay, now this is going to start building up larger and larger, larger bands of stuff. Or I should say bands of, or a net maybe is the best way, the, a larger and larger net of elements. Okay, they're going to start binding each other. And if you start looking at this, silica up here, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. This oxygen, because they're binding into a crystal, is actually going to bind to an aluminum that's down here. This is going to bind to another oxygen and a silica with oxygen, oxygen, oxygen over here. Okay. This aluminum potentially binding over to another oxygen here, potentially binding to an aluminum here, oxygen, aluminum. So these things grow. And they get bigger and bigger and bigger. But they tend to be plate-like, flat. Okay. But I can have layers of plates. There are binding agents between the plates. Because if you think about the charges associated with each one of these elements, the charges are not necessa necessarily satisfied. Okay, uh, let's go back to this one, silica oxide. Okay, this plus, what is it? SO plus four, plus three. No. Charge, plus three, I think it is plus three. These are all negative charges. So I've created a polar environment. This is actually negative plus two, negative two. Okay, one of those negative charges is satisfied by the positive charge that's here. Okay, which means that I still have a negative charge exposed, which now means proton is going to bind to this. Proton's going to bind to this. Proton's going to bind to this. Okay, the chemical formula for this is a uh, S I. <coughs> Uh, this is not quite right. Something along those lines. Okay? But this is binding to a larger crystal. So this, the hydroxide, the hydrogen that was here, is getting knocked off and aluminum's going there. Okay? So I now have a charge change. Okay? Now, this is assuming that this crystal is forming in a pure mixture of aluminum, silica, and oxygen. The reality is it's not, which means that other things can substitute into these points. And if another element substitutes in here, it might not, in fact, have the same charge, positive charge or negative charge, as the oxygen or the aluminum. And if that's the case, my crystal is going to have a charge imbalance. Does that make sense? And if it has a charge imbalance, it's going to be a charged particle. It's going to either have a positive charge or a negative charge. Now, when we start talking about colloid chemistry a little bit later in the semester, it turns out that most of the substitutions that occur into the silicon aluminum points are put in with elements that have a larger charge, or I should say a, a, a more positive charge than the aluminum and silica. So as a result, the entire crystal, back to this crystal, has a net negative charge. Does that make sense? <coughs> if it has a net negative charge, it is going to be attractive. 
to ions that have a positive charge. Those ions that are sitting in solution out here, imagine it's a potassium, OK, a potassium plus 1. That potassium is going to be electronically charged, I mean, like a magnet, is going to be attracted to that crystal. Okay? In our case, that crystal is basically clay. That is what we call the cation exchange capacity, CEC. This, a cation versus an anion, a cation is a positively charged ion. An anion is a negatively charged ion. Okay? So the capacity of this clay to hang on to positively charged ions is called cation exchange capacity, CEC. And that's where we get back to this, the activity class. How charged that clay is is going to have an effect on how much cations it can hold. If it has a high charge, it's going to be superactive. If it has a low charge, a really low charge, it's going to be subactive. Does that make sense? And it all has to do with how those crystals are put together. Go. Um, potentially. Probably what you're seeing there is you're seeing more, in that case, it's not actually the clays that's important, it's actually the nutrients that are being delivered. The salts are coming as these cations. The cation exchange capacity is just the ability of this clay to hang on to that. Okay? So it has nothing to do with the delivery, it actually has more to do with the storage. Does that make sense? Okay, so this crystal is being formed. I mean, so I, let's take the next step. Okay, we've got primary minerals. The magma is forming these crystals, right? Okay, these crystals come up to the surface. They can be big crystals, they can be small crystals. These crystals come up to the surface and they, get, they undergo surficial weathering. If they undergo surficial weathering, there's an opportunity for these crystals to be modified through weathering process. I literally could strip this silica out and put something else in. And that secondary withering, weathering is going to change the cation exchange capacity even more. So these crystals come up with a charge, and then you put them on the surface, and you start weathering them, and you're going to modify that charge. You can make it more negative. You can, in fact, make it positive. Okay? And in fact, the more you weather it, the more and more and more it's weathered, the more and more you're going to take the impurities out. Now, this sounds strange. Okay, you would expect the more it's exposed to the surface, the less and less of the impurities are, the more and more of the impurities are going to be in there. But do you guys remember that pie chart of the crustal composition? Yeah, remember that pie chart when it's oxygen, a big, huge part of the pie? Well, if I start stripping things away, the things that are preferentially going to be lost because they're nutrients are all going to be the finer pies, the thinner slices of those pies. So what's going to be left behind is predominantly iron, aluminum, and oxygen, the top three, with some silica in there. Go. Silicon, sorry. When you have that silica hydroxide and then the aluminums are replacing the hydrogen, that's creating an acidic environment? The aluminums aren't replacing, replacing the but they're like taking them off. So yeah, so Kind of. So the question is, is the aluminum in tandem with the CEC? Um, actually, this is plus four. Um, I'm not quite. So the let's restate the question because I'm not quite understanding the question. So you have the silica with the three hydroxides bonded to it, and then you said that the aluminum bonds instead of the hydrogen. So then you have. Yeah. So, and that's um, the high CEC. So, with the level of acidity and high CEC, are they kind of related? Like, could you? Yes, actually, they are very related. In fact, the, um, 
actually, this is, I've got this backwards. This is SE plus four, aluminum's plus three. Okay, so these, the silica makes the tetrahedral one, but actually, let me draw it over here, okay? And let's use the aluminum one as an example, okay? Aluminum is three plus, okay? And it's going to bind to three oxygen, which have a proton attached to it. So that makes the hydroxide, okay? This simple aluminum hydroxide. Now, this aluminum is the framework or the building block for a larger crystal lattice, okay? Now, this oxygen here would go to a silica which would be that middle, so this is actually reversed. This should be, uh, this should be silica here and this should be aluminum here. This should be aluminum there, okay? Okay, so there's another aluminum one down here, okay? Now, this proton, as these things are building, that proton is going to be lost and it's going to be binding to another aluminum, okay? I'm, I'm building it up and then I'm going to break it apart, okay? This will be attached to a uh, silica down here. This is going to, uh, no, oxygen, silica. This is going to have an oxygen here binding to here, and so on and so forth. Okay, and this is just going to start building this way, and it's going to build one more layer that way. Yep. Okay, now, when this starts to weather in the real world, now, the truth is, when this came up, this is not pure mineral. This is not pure aluminum and silica. There's other elements in there. But let's imagine that it did come up pure. Okay. As it's weathered out here, you know, I have iron, I have all different other kinds of elements that are out here. As this thing gets weathered, this can be replaced. Okay. And if this is plus three, and this is plus three, I have the same charge. Okay. But they're not the same size. So I'm definitely going to be changing the shape of it. But if I happen to put in a different type of element, let's say I put in a sodium or something else, I potentially can put in an element in here that's plus two. I now have a negative charge in this crystal. Okay, I don't know. What time is it? I have no watch today. 50, it's, it's time. Okay, two more minutes. Let me finish this, okay? This is ultimately, the weathering is going to start occurring where the entire thing starts disappearing. And you, back, you come back to this ALOH. At this point, you potentially will start modifying the pH by more protons going in, but this also acts to resist pH change because if I take the protons off here for whatever reason and then I start adding protons into the system, those protons will be automatically attracted to that. Okay, so it's a, it's a game and we'll talk about that later in the semester. Okay, guys, remember to take a look at your monoliths. Okay, take a look at the monoliths. Try to track down, or track down all of the soil taxonomy and come back with me with a description of what that classification actually means. Okay? Otherwise, be free.